In this lecture, we'll take the idea of the embedding vectors we first saw in the previous lecture, and we'll look at some other places where it can be applied. Our first topic is a very common task for machine learning, recommender systems. This is something that isn't quite classification or regression, and is best modeled as an abstract task in its own right. The standard example of a recommender system is recommending movies to users, and that's no accident. The modern concept of a recommender system was probably born in 2006 when Netflix, then mainly a DVD rental service, released a data set of user movie ratings and offered a $1 million prize for anybody who could improve the root mean squared error of their current predicted ratings by 10%. This not only sparked an interest in recommendation as a task, but also probably started the craze for machine learning competitions that later led to websites like Kaggle. We'll use the movie task as a running example, but we'll also look at some other settings that can be translated to the same abstract task. Let's start by looking at the Netflix task and at what types of data we have available. The defining property of the abstract task of recommendation is that the primary source of data is explicit user ratings. We ask the users to tell us which movies they like and which movies they dislike, and hopefully they'll oblige. They do this only for a few movies, and from the small set of user movie pairs that we know the rating for, we must predict the rest. Predicting ratings based on explicit feedback like this is sometimes known as collaborative filtering. The users collaborate together by providing ratings to help filter the movies that they like out of the large amount of those available. The main drawback here is that the information can be very sparse. We only get a few ratings per user, and some users won't give any ratings at all. We'll look at some ways to deal with that in the next video. For now, we'll see what we can do with just explicit feedback. Movie recommendation is the canonical use case for recommender systems, but the idea applies to many other systems. Amazon was probably the first to use personalized recommendation to help users navigate their website. The principle is similar to Netflix. There are many users, a large database of items, and we have some information about which users liked which items in the past, so we can predict which one they'll like in the future. Another use case is news stories. There is a lot of news out there, and people have limited time, so with a recommender system, we can help people find the articles they're interested in. In the most general sense, the abstract task of recommendation is applicable to any situation where you have two large sets of things and a particular relation between them. The relation can be binary, it either holds or it doesn't, whether or not a user likes a movie, or whether a user bought a book, or it can come with a label that indicates the extent to which it holds. Often, one side of the relation is a set of users, and the other side of the relation is a set of items. But this need not always be the case. For instance, if you have a large collection of ingredients, and a large collection of recipes in which the ingredients occur, you could model this as a recommendation task. The resulting prediction may help to give you some ideas for which combinations of ingredients and recipes would work well together. And we can also use models like this in scientific analysis. For instance, based on a large data set of which politician voted for which law, we can make an analysis of general voting behavior by elected officials. It can even be the case that the items on the left and the right of the relation are the same set. For instance, if we want to recommend which people should be friends. The key property of the abstract task is that in principle you have no information, no features of the two types of objects beyond which ones are linked to each other by the relation. Or if you do have some features as well, you consider those secondary information and you want to base your predictions primarily on the property linking the two classes of objects. So this is the abstract task of recommendation. We are given two sets, one of items of type A and one of items of type B, and a relation linking some of the A's to some of the B's, and our task is to predict new links between the A's and B's. The links may be unlabeled, in which case they simply hold or they don't hold. They may be labeled with a class, for instance in the case of like and dislike ratings, or they may come with a numeric value. In the labeled cases, the class or the number always expresses the extent to which the link holds. Recommendation is probably the most widely deployed machine learning method. 
In fact, in many social media platforms, recommendation is now the primary means of navigation. When you load your Facebook feed, your Twitter timeline, or your YouTube homepage, the main content you see is based on recommendation. You see the items in their database that the algorithm thinks you're going to like or at least engage with based on your past behavior. In fact, recommendation algorithms are now so prevalent that they are becoming a central component of the fabric of society. For a large proportion of the population, for instance, recommendation algorithms decide which news stories they see and which analysis of those stories they're exposed to. The consequences are difficult to oversee, and many issues have been discussed over the past few years. Filter bubbles may shield people from encountering different viewpoints. Optimizing algorithms for engagement may drive people towards more extreme viewpoints. And all of this put together may even make the process of democracy more vulnerable to manipulation. In other words, it is not entirely clear at the moment whether recommendation algorithms, on the whole, are a force for good or something that has grown too big for us to entirely oversee the consequences of. Either way, it pays to understand exactly how they work. In the rest of the lecture, we'll keep to the movie recommendation use case to keep things concrete. But everything we say can easily be adapted to other instances of the abstract recommendation task. We'll start with the case where we have numeric ratings, which may be negative if a user dislikes a movie and positive if they like it. Surprisingly, this is the easiest setting to handle. We'll see later how to extend this to non-negative ratings, class-labeled ratings, and to unlabeled ratings. We can view the space of all possible ratings as a matrix, with the users along one side and the movies along another. For some user-movie combinations, we have a rating, but most of the matrix is empty, and these are the values that we want to predict. The problem, as we said before, is that we have no representation for the users or for the movies. And we've seen this problem before, in the word embedding problem. There, each word was an atomic object. And what we did was to represent each word by its own vector, and then learn the values of these vectors to perform some downstream task. And we'll do that here as well. We assign a vector of initially random numbers to each user and to each movie. And we will optimize the contents of these vectors to give us good predictions for the ratings. The number of each element's k in each vector is a hyperparameter that we can set freely, but we must use the same k for both the user and the movie embeddings. We arrange the embeddings into two matrices, u and m, so that each column of u is one of the embeddings for one of our users, and each column of m is one of the embeddings for one of our movies. To see now how these values should be set, let's imagine first what we might do if we could set them by hand. In other words, how might we solve the problem if we could craft feature vectors for each movie and each user? In that case, we can imagine setting the values by hand to represent various aspects for the users and the movies that match each other. We might, for instance, encode in one feature how much a user likes romance, which we can make negative for a strong dislike of romance and positive for a strong affinity for romance. And we could then encode in the corresponding movie feature how much romance the movie contains. Based on these representations, we then need to come up with a score function. Some function that takes the two representations and outputs a highly positive number if the user is well matched to the movie, a large negative number if the user will probably dislike the movie, and a number near zero if the user will be ambivalent about the movie. There are a few options, but a particularly simple one is the dot product between the user embedding and the movie embedding. This neatly expresses how much of a match the two are. If the user loves romance and the movie contains loads of it, then the romance term in the sum becomes very big. The same holds if both values are negative. The user hates romance and the movie is very unromantic. For mismatches, a user loves romance and the movie is unromantic, the term becomes negative and the score is brought down. A second effect is one of magnitude. If the user is ambivalent to romance, then the romance feature can be set to zero, and that term doesn't count towards the total. And for small values, the term contributes a little bit. Other score functions are possible, but the dot product is by far the most popular, and we'll stick with that for the rest of the lecture. In a matrix multiplication, where matrix A times matrix B equals matrix C, 
Each element of C contains the dot product of one row of A with one column of B. This means that multiplying the transpose of our user embedding matrix with our movie embedding matrix gives us a matrix of rating predictions for every single user movie pair in our data. In other words, if we had movie features and user features that matched each other in this way, and we used the dot product to give us a prediction for how much the user will like the movie, then multiplying these matrices together will give us a matrix of ratings. And the closer this matrix of ratings is to the matrix of ratings that we are given, the better our predictions. So if we look at the problem the other way around, where we are given a rating matrix, but we don't actually have features for the users in the movies, the problem becomes to take the given rating matrix R and to decompose it as the product of two factors U and M. If we find matrices U and M for which the product UTM comes close to the given matrix R, then we can assume that those matrices U and M contain good embeddings for our users and for our movies. This is why this kind of approach to recommendation is sometimes called matrix factorization or matrix decomposition. And this brings us to our optimization problem. We are given a matrix R of recommendations and we are to choose embedding matrices U and M so that their product is close to R. To turn this into a problem we can solve, we need to make precise how to measure how close together two matrices are. The simplest option is to measure the Frobenius norm of the difference between the two matrices. This sounds complicated, but it's just the same as the vector norm, but applied to matrices. We sum the squares of the elements of the matrix together and take the square root of the sum. If we minimize the square of the Frobenius norm, this is just minimizing the sum of the squared differences between the true rating matrix and our predictions. In other words, we compute predictions by taking the dot product of a user embedding and a movie embedding. We compute the error of our prediction by subtracting this from the true rating that we've observed. We square that and we sum it over our entire matrix. And choosing our embeddings U and M to minimize this value should give us good predictions for the missing ratings. One problem is that R is not complete. For most user movie pairs, we don't know the rating. If we did, we wouldn't need a recommender system. The matrix R is actually an incomplete matrix. We often fill in the unknown ratings with zeros, but they are really unknown values. If we compute the squared error for the whole matrix, we are essentially telling our model to predict a zero rating for all of these unknown values, when actually the true ratings here may be very high or very low. The solution is simple. We define the loss only for the known ratings. So note that this minimization objective is the same that we saw before, except i and j now iterate only over those elements in the matrix for which we actually know the rating. This can make optimization a bit more difficult, but it can lead to better models. So now that we have our optimization objective, how do we work out a good solution? How do we find good values for our embedding vectors? The obvious choice is gradient descent. This is probably the most versatile and scalable option, but there is an alternative in the form of alternating optimization. We won't dig into it deeply, but here is the basic principle. The equation R equals the transpose of U times M is a simple linear matrix equation with two unknowns. If we had one unknown, it would be easy to solve analytically using basic linear algebra methods. If we knew the perfect embeddings for the movies, we could analytically solve for the optimal embeddings for the users, and vice versa. So, starting with a random U and a random M, we can enter a loop, fix M and optimize for U, and then fix U and optimize for M. This is known as alternating least squares. ALS has some computational benefits for small datasets, but in practice gradient descent seems to be more flexible, for instance in dealing with missing values, different loss functions, and in adding various regularizers. The simplest way to apply gradient descent is to implement recommendation in an automatic differentiation system. If we do that, we can just define U and M as parameters, compute our loss, and backpropagate. However, it's instructive to work out the gradients for the squared error loss by hand, because they're not that complex, and they give us some insight into exactly how the gradient descent algorithm updates the embedding values. To do this, these are the gradients we need to work out. 
gradient of the loss L with respect to the kth embedding value of the embedding of user L and the gradient of the loss L for the kth embedding of movie M. We'll start with the user embedding. First, we define a matrix E, which is the difference between all of our predictions and all of the known ratings. The total loss is then simply the sum over all squared elements of E or only over those squared elements of E for which we know the true rating. Either way, the gradient works out as this value on the left here, to which we apply the chain rule to get rid of the square. On the left vector, the two cancels out against the one half in front of the sum. And in the right vector, we can now fill in the definition of E, which is Rij minus the dot product of the ith user embedding with the jth movie embedding. The term Rij is independent of our parameters, so it disappears. And the parameter for which we are computing the derivative only occurs in the term on the right if i is equal to l. For all other terms in this sum, the derivative is zero, so we can set i equal to l and remove all other terms from the sum. And note that the minus sign in front of the dot product has been moved outside in front of the sum. This dot product is itself a sum, where again only one term is non-zero, and that's the term where ukl is multiplied by mkj. The rest of the terms disappear, and for that term, ukl cancels out, and only mkj remains. So with that, we have worked out the gradient for one of the elements in our user embedding matrix. Let's see what this means if we use it in a gradient descent update step. This is what we've worked out, which is the gradient for this one element of the user embedding matrix u. And we can rewrite this as a dot product. j iterates over the lth row of e and the kth row of m. So we can rewrite this gradient as the dot product of those two slices of these two matrices. And this tells us that if we apply a gradient update step to element k of the user embedding of user L, we are adding to it the dot product of this row of E, or column of E transposed, and this row of M. Imagine that the kth value of the user and movie embeddings represents how romantic the user and movie are respectively. Now imagine that we had a movie that we think is very romantic and a user that we think is very romantic. That is, for both, the kth value in their embedding is high. Since these embeddings match well, we end up giving a high rating. Now imagine that the actual rating was much lower, so that we end up with a negative error. Element Lm of the matrix E is a large negative number. The update rule tells us what this means. The movie's kth element was high, and we're taking that as a constant at the moment. And therefore, we can only assume that the large error was due to the user. We update the user's kth value by this large negative error multiplied by the movie's large positive k value. And we end up subtracting a large value from the user's k value. In short, assuming that both the movie and the user were romantic gave us a large error, and we are treating the movie as a constant at this point, so we conclude that the user must be less romantic than we thought. When we look at the update for the movie, we see the opposite. We subtract from the current movie's k value all of the user's k values multiplied by their error values for this particular movie. If we imagine the same scenario as in the previous slide, we see that the reverse happens here. If we assumed that both the movie and the user were romantic, and we get a large negative error, then we end up then we end up making the movie less romantic because we take the fact that the user was romantic as a constant. In practice, of course, we apply both update rules, so both the movie and the user end up getting a little less romantic. Of course, there is no guarantee that the embeddings we learn correspond to anything meaningful, but just like in the word to vec example, if after training we investigate the embedding space, we do see that particular areas and directions in the embedding space correspond to meaningful high-level semantics. So now, let's look at what to do if our rating system is binary. Instead of a numeric rating, we get two buttons, one to like and one to dislike, like we see on YouTube and on Netflix. Then, the scores for each user item pair are best understood as classes, a positive class for like and a negative class for dislike. We can turn our dot product score into a binary class 
by applying a sigmoid to the dot product. So we compute the dot product as before, but we then pass the dot product through a sigmoid function to turn it into a value between 0 and 1, and we interpret the magnitude as the probability that the user u likes the movie m. And we interpret 1 minus that magnitude as the probability that the user u dislikes the movie m. And with this score function, we can define the basic logarithmic loss that we know from logistic regression. We first sum over all the likes we have, and we set our loss function so that we maximize the log probability of those likes under the model. And then we sum over all the dislikes we have, and we set the loss function so that we maximize the log probability under the model that those are dislikes. And the gradient for this loss will allow us to train effective embeddings that do well in predicting these kinds of binary ratings. An even simpler interface in recommender systems is one where we get only positive ratings. You can like something, but you cannot dislike it or assign a number. It's what we see here on Vimeo, but also on Twitter and on Facebook. The benefit of such rating systems is that users are much more likely to give ratings. First, because it's less work, and second, because it has a direct benefit for the user. They're not just doing it to improve their recommendations, which some users may not care about. They are effectively bookmarking the things they like, so that they can easily find them again. Thus, you are likely to get many more ratings if you build your system this way. The downside is that the modeling task is much more complicated. It's like a classification task, where the only labels you get are positive and unknown. For the unknowns, you don't know how many positives there are and how many negatives. If we just optimize the score function to be as big as possible for the known likes, then there's nothing stopping the system from making the ratings as high as it can for all user movie pairs. A common and very effective trick here is to sample random pairs of users and movies and assume that these are negatives. Usually the proportion of positive user movie pairs is vanishingly small compared to the proportion of pairs that are either negative or pairs for which the users are ambivalent. So, if we sample a random pair, we can be almost certain that the user won't like the movie or won't much care about the movie. Commonly, we take multiple negative samples for each positive one. And the number of negative samples we take, r, is a hyperparameter. And with these negative samples in hand, we can treat the problem as a binary classification problem like we saw in the last slide, and train our embeddings with logarithmic loss. So far, we've assumed that we don't have any information about our users and our movies by themselves, only the links between them. In practice, this isn't true at all. As you see here, Netflix has lots of extra information about both the users and the movies in its database. For instance, a rating, a running time, the year of production, who stars in the movie, and a short description of the plot. Now it's easy to extract lots of features for a movie, and it's probably similarly easy to get a hold of some features for the users. It's just that so far we've assumed that the ratings are the most informative, so that we should start there. Of course, ideally, we don't want to dismiss any information we have, even if this information doesn't contribute as much as the explicit feedback, we'd still like to use it if it can give our system a little boost. In the next video, we'll look at how we can extend a recommendation system with these kinds of extra sources of information.